Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Benjamin Smythe. Welcome, Benjamin. Hi, Rick. And Benjamin is a really fun guy. Um, I've, uh, I think I deserve the um, coffee mug or the T-shirt or even the, uh, you know, even the little satchel that, that you might give out for people who actually listen to all of your YouTube videos, because I've listened to all 78 of them. And um, if that doesn't deserve a prize, nothing does. <laughs> you do. You get a prize. <laughs> okay, good job. I'll I give out pacifiers. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you're a fun guy. I mean, you know, you're sort of a performance artist of non-duality or something, we might say, uh, and pe as people will see when they watch your videos. And, and I really appreciate your, your sensitivity and your... Um, I mean, you're a tender-hearted guy. I, I've I've seen you, you know, laugh uncontrollably and break into tears and just go through all sorts of, you know, what I would say are very sensitive um, fluctuations of emotion that you don't always see and people display publicly. Um, so that's nice. And I also say would say you're kind of a gutsy guy. I mean, you've um, you know spent countless hours sitting out on the street with a, a "You're Perfect" sign. And I guess you're known in some parts as the you're perfect guy. Um, and that's kind of cool. So we'll talk about that. Um, one thing I was curious about when we were setting up this interview, at one point you, you, you emailed me and said you didn't want to do it. And then you emailed back and said, I want to do it after all. Was, what was going on with that? Were, were you afraid like I would give you a hard time or that I had bad breath? Or, uh, you know, or was it totally unrelated to anything? It was unrelated. I had this small... Um this period of where I realized I needed to be quiet for a uh -huh. while, and I, d I didn't know how long that was going to be. So I actually canceled all my trips, and, and it ended up lasting only uh, about well four or five days of not uh -huh. talking. And then I was like, okay, it's, talk again. Yeah. And some, there was something I needed to learn in there, so then I just set everything back up. And but it wasn't you, you know. I, it okay, I won't take it personally personal. then. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, well, you know, just because you're uh, paranoid doesn't mean they're not actually out to get you. So. <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about that later, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I can understand the need to be quiet thing, too. I mean, you know, some people have sometimes asked me why I don't teach. And I actually did teach for about 25 years. I was a teacher of meditation. But a lot of the times I was just parroting stuff that I'd been taught to say. And I, I just kind of reached a point, and I'm still at a point, where I don't want to say anything unless I'm really saying it from my own experience, um, genuinely. Uh, no extrapolation, no speculation, unless I make it clear that I'm speculating. Uh, <laughs> you know, just kind of, you know, I'd rather sell shoes or something. Yeah, I, I met a man, um, Philip Moffat, who he teaches in the Spirit Rock mm -hmm. meditation community, and he said, I was going to teach a yoga class when I was younger, like maybe 23. And I said, oh, I'm a little nervous. And he goes, oh, we'll just talk about what you actually know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, oh, okay. Well, yeah. I can do that. You know, yeah. like, don't talk about anything I don't understand, you know, or I haven't experienced myself. So I hear you. That's, that's integrity. Yeah. That's, a, that's important because it's obviously easy to philosophize all of this. Yeah, and there are plenty of voices out there that I feel are a lot more articulate than mine. So why should I duplicate their efforts? I'm, I'm good at asking questions, so I'm doing this now, you know. Yeah. Well, the, thing I the thing I would say is that every time somebody kind of pops up and starts sharing from the groundhog hole of their experience, uh -huh. there's, a cr there's, there's a resonance that just starts spreading out. And sure, you know, you know you've been in the circle for a long time, you've had lots of experiences, so obviously there's all kinds of people doing all kinds of stuff, but because you know it here, that doesn't mean your neighbor knows about it, or that doesn't mean the guy down the street knows about it, or that doesn't mean, you know, like everybody who shares, if they're doing it authentically, from their heart, I would say, mm -hmm. is going to touch somebody, and that's very important. Yeah. You, know, we don't, you don't have to be a 5,000, 10,000 crowd, crowd pleaser, you know, you don't have to draw a big audience, you could draw two people, but those two people matter. And so it really, you know, if you have any sense of wanting to share, there's no reason to hesitate, it doesn't have to look humongous. Yeah, no, that's a good point, and uh, I th and I think that's part of the reason why there are so many teachers these days. It's sort of like a, a many, to, just like the internet itself. It's a kind of a many to many matrix rather than a one to many, yeah, you know, setup. And it seems to be characteristic of the times, uh, both technologically and spiritually. Right, and that's the good and the bad side of it because you know anybody can do it. Yeah, and so then it's kind of wading through. Well, wait, where's where's the authenticity in there? 
But I think yeah. people can feel that pretty quickly. There, there, something does resonate, whether or not it resonates with everyone. Yeah, and if nothing else, maybe it's necessary for people to uh, fine-tune their, their bullshit detectors. Exactly. <laughs> and oh, so there's, there's plenty of opportunity for that. You know? <laughs> there's nothing like the Internet for that. Holy <laughs> yeah, well, it uh, must be true. I saw it on the Internet. <laughs> you know, good old Facebook. You, know, you yeah. wade through all kinds of different sort of arguments within the conversation. You get to the point where we're like, wow, cool, I'm done with that. I don't want to argue anymore. Where's the love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an ironic thing, too. You see these guys, you know, getting really nasty about non-duality. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, yeah, anybody who says such and such is just full of it. You know, this is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of it. I mean, in, fun, in, in a funny way, that's non-duality. Yeah. It's being wonderful. grumpy, you know, being, being a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. Well, in that respect, everything is non-duality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 that's, the, that's the bad news and the good news. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing's off limits. So, uh, Let's get into the Ben story a little bit, just for fun. Um, I've heard it because I listened to all your videos, but uh, please tell it again for those who haven't. In um, 2008, after a long time of seeking in that classic way of sitting zazen and playing with everything I could play with. Formal teachers and all? I mean, no. Well, I'd go, to, I'd go to retreats, but I never actually worked with anybody particularly. I had a uh, pretty negative experience when I was very, like 19 with a teacher, and I thought, you know what, maybe they're all kind of nuts. So <laughs> I just sort of sat by myself and then would go in and out of communities. And there's positives and negatives to that. I've gotten to make a lot of mistakes, yeah. sort of learn, learn the hard way. But, um, but I hit this bottom, you know, I hit this sort of exhaustion. And at the bottom of that, I got out under the stars one night and stepped onto my deck and from the most honest place in my heart was just whispered, God? I mean, it was like the bottom, you know, God. And nothing happened mm -hmm. and everything answered. Hmm. And, and it was a very sort of, it was just, I don't know, it was like, a, it was just like that. Everything answered. This is it. Everything is God. You know, energy, whatever we want to play philosophically. But, but it was a felt sense of it, and it just kind of, and it's never really stopped answering. I've just, um, I've had to learn, like many people do, I think, how to play out the momentum of the conditioning from, not necessarily the life before, but just from sort of all the beliefs from before. And I've done that in a very messy way out loud on the internet. And, <laughs> and that's been very funny, because at this point, like, at least at where I'm sitting now, I can see that they happen that way, and there are there are more I think mature ways to do that. So, at this point, um, I find myself calming down, even well, though I, I have fun. But I I don't. There's a lot of uh, yeah. I just it feels very clear to just stay close to the love. Well, you know, I think it's you've probably done people a service by displaying your working out of the conditioning because I think maybe some people erroneously assume that awakening is this clean break night and day <laughs> on and off kind of you know transition where you're just like you know Mr. Perfect ever after that and uh, you know um, I don't think that's happened in the history of humanity there's no. there's you know there's always stuff to work out and even you know the most advanced or popular teachers that you talk to these days if they're honest which the, the most I'd say the most mature ones are they say yeah I'm still working stuff out oh, and, yeah. and, and they usually say well it doesn't grip me like it used to even the Sargadatta you know someone asked him do you ever get kind of overshadowed and he said yeah but it only lasts a moment and then mm -hmm. I'm out mm -hmm. of it <laughs> yeah that, that definitely feels um, true for my experience is that things just don't last as long when they stick like it's very easy to see like oh I'm believing this or I'm yeah. getting caught in this and then it just sort of drops away but I, I find this is an endless learning process mm -hmm. I, there's no arriving as far as I can tell it's just constantly opening and opening and opening and, mm -hmm. and learning how to be a good person which is really funny you know in the end it, I really feel like that's it yeah. just learning, learning how to help my neighbors and be a good human being and get rid of the pomp and get rid of the arrogance and get rid of the I have something and just be a really good person mm. which is not an easy task it's it's you know we can all do our best and our best is really much bigger than we want to admit you know and that's the relationship I'm always playing with how I do see. I do how do I do my best when my best is giving you my organs <laughs> and then yeah I mean I want to do my best but sometimes even my best scares me 
there's a there's a kind of a cool metaphor I've used it I've said it before here but you might enjoy it which is um, used in the sort of Vedic tradition where you know someone who is sort of deeply conditioned and perhaps not awakened might be it's like making a an impression or an experience is like making a line in stone, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, it really, it etches in, it lasts a long time. A um, little bit more freedom, a little bit less conditioning, and it's more like making a line in sand, maybe. And then a line in water, and then a line in air. So, you know, st you still have the experiences. In fact, you can make a deeper line in water than you can in stone, deeper, richer experience, but it just goes away right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that what you just said about you know conditioning it doesn't last that the, the imp things just it's like water off a duck's back you know just whew, you, ha you experience yeah. it it's gone you don't hang on to it for 20 years what I'm finding too is that stuff like new stuff comes yeah like deep deep like one years old two years old stuff <clears throat> you know like wanting to be held by my father or wanting my mother to listen to me and, and those stuff that stuff comes out and it's it's been very beautiful to be like oh okay yeah. like playing that out as best I can and, and, and not running from it or trying to sort of philosophize it away but just cry and feel it and, and really let that out so that going back to like sitting in the womb you know before everything was scary like wow this is going to be great yeah. and then seemingly having that be very close to the lived experience now but, but I think it's just endless learning and there's, I, there's so, much, so much to learn yeah you know I, I just before we, we lose it I just wanted to say that you know sometimes in uh, spiritual circles these days um, seeking is poo-pooed you know it's um, it's kind of like dismissed as being a uh, waste of time or something you should drop or something you shouldn't do or something like that but uh, you know I mean Patanjali who wrote the Yoga Sutras actually said that the the, the degree of intensity of the, the seeker actually in a way actually determines the sort of rapidity with which realization occurs. He classified seekers as mild, medium, intense, and vehemently intense. And yeah, and you often see this. I mean, in your own case, uh, you were a pretty ardent seeker, I would say, from what I've gathered. You know, and that, that thing when you went out on the back porch and you said, God, it was like, you know, you weren't sort of being ambivalent or wishy-washy. There was a, an well, earnest kind of yearning you know, desire to like, you know, what the hell's going on? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was as dumb as I could ever have been. I mean, I have never been as humble in the, in in my life and as in that moment. Yeah, and that 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 combination of humility and earnestness, you know, sincere desire for realization or whatever term we want to use, bore fruit. Yeah, and then what's funny is I find like now it's like remembering that humility. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the, that's the, it's not difficult, but that's really the key for, is just keep remembering, like, that place of being right there at the bottom and, and feeling that, wow, the wonder of there, and then not going, not moving too far from that, because then all of a sudden, as, and I've done it, you know, you get into the games of it, and, and there's sort of a social currency to the whole spiritual conversation, and then there's the arguing, and there's the, and it's just kind of like, what does any of this have to do with that love? Yeah. You know, and 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 then you know, learning again, learning like okay, play. Oh, that doesn't feel good. And <laughs> go back down and play. And go. so it's just kind of dancing there. And hmm. but it feels it feels very important to remember for me to remember that that moment of of knowing nothing and just reaching out and and trying to stay there. And I'm not good at it all the time because I like to be clever and I I like to play with words. And but I do my best. That's nice. There's a a verse I think it's in the Gita or someplace where Lord Lord Krishna says. Taking crewing cur back on myself, I create again and again, mm. and mm. it's kind of reminiscent of what you just said. It's like you just kind of keep coming back, and then you know ex expand in creativity and playfulness and activities and so on. But you always keep coming back, you know, to the to that humble state, as you put it. Yeah, there's a still point. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's right here, mm -hmm. and so it's that it's that still point where nothing's really moving and happening and there's not too much. Yeah. And, and then from there, there seems to be endless, like, endless creativity and, mm -hmm. and compassion and caring and, yeah. and playfulness and you know, goofiness and mm -hmm. just kind of keeping it close to that. Well, you know, it's kind of the way the universe works. I mean, a physicist would tell you that there's a level of uh, you know, <laughs> silence and stillness and, and whatnot which um, 
uh, on which nothing is happening and nothing has ever happened. It's kind of the ground state of the universe. And at the same time, inherent within that is infinite dynamism and infinite creativity, which then you know manifests as this whole incredible, marvelous universe. And we're like little encapsulations of that process, you know, as as human beings. We're, we're experiencing the same dynamics within ourselves as the universe itself uh, goes by and its whole process of functioning. What I love about that is that the universe is saying that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like language itself is alive. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the idea of like m memes and memetics makes a lot of sense because l the culture and the information is alive. Like we're, it's l we're literally playing catch with it from brain to brain right here and then we walk away and we have something, we meet somebody else, we say something. So I love thinking of language as an organism that's moving through bodies that are busy trying to stay healthy and alive. Uh -huh. it seems like, oh, I'm speaking, but then when you get down to it, it's like, well, here, here's, here's the universe talking and kind of passing more information on to itself, seemingly to open wider and wider to the wow that it is. Because what I love is everything we know, we know everything except for what just happened around the world right now. Mm. Like even the physics, even the theories, all of that is spoken from this position that just happened a second ago. Because this is in motion, right? We're aging, we're slowly moving, it's, it's moving in a direction. So it's so beautiful that no matter what I come up with, I'm missing what just happened. I'm missing the information that just happened. I can extrapolate and infer from everything I know, but I can't talk about what's over right now and what just happened. But that's not and a I've, problem, right? It doesn't feel like a problem at all. In fact, it feels wonderful because yeah. then this part of me that's trying to come up with a conclusion, which doesn't happen as much anymore, doesn't it's like okay fine I don't get to know and then it's more like there's wonder and there's awe yeah. and awe awe is the most fascinating emotion because why does awe arise mm -hmm. you know like love makes sense because we want to work together but awe that the, just the wow quality of a sunset or a kiss or a, a really good experience with someone or a place it's just you know I feel like that's the moment when the universe sees itself it just goes mm. oh wow wow <laughs> Even right now, like looking at you, you know, like one of a kind, never before. You know, like, <laughs> look at you, you know, yeah. like, wow. Nobody wow. has a nose like this. <laughs> no, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'm, yeah, definitely. They used to call me Pinocchio in the second grade. Well, it has a nice little, you know, it's yeah. a nice little slow. It's great. <laughs> great. It's the only nose like that in the exactly, world. Exactly, yeah. My, in fact, my father once said to me, where did you get that beak? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You it, go from you, brother. <laughs> right, well, it didn't look like his nose. <laughs> uh oh, well, milk man. Yeah, right. <laughs> we actually did have a milkman in those days. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> um, I said this last week. I don't want to be too repetitive, but it, it, you know what you just said triggered it. Uh, this rem this remembers. I, I got this. Little, I'm on Eckhart Tolle's little e mass email list that he sends out. You know this present present moment reminder. He calls it, and he sent out one where he, he said uh, he said we're. We're, ultimately, we're not persons. We're focal points through which the universe knows itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of what you just said. And also, I, I could take it as, I'd like to take it another step and say, you know, the universe is a focal point through which consciousness knows itself. And we are little parts of that massive trillion you know, faceted focal point. So you know, we're just sort of consciousness knowing itself and having created a, a marvelous instrumentality through which it can know itself. You know, this human nervous system is incredible. Yes. And what I love is that either way, like whether we take one, you know, whichever direction you come at, mm. it looks exactly like this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's, so, it's so simple. It looks exactly like this. It looks like having a conversation with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. You know, it's, there's nothing more, more miraculous than the ordinary. Yeah. You know, as, far, as far as I can tell. That thing you said a minute ago about, um, you know, whatever we're saying now, we can't really know what happened a minute ago or what just happened. Well, we, yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened a second ago. Around the yeah. globe. I mean, if we're thinking yeah. of information as in a living organism, I'm missing information. I have to be honest about that. Mm. As long as I make my conclusion, I'm missing information. Or like, if I'm coming up with a model of what's going on, well, I'm inside the model. So, and, and this is in motion, so I have to take that into account. But yeah. the, mo the model maker is also moving as the model is moving. So if I say, oh, it's like this, right. I, I have to be open to the reality that I'm incomplete. In Gödel's kind of incompleteness theorem way, I'm always going to be missing something. Hmm. So it's so much nicer, I find, to not live with a conclusion and, and just sort of be open and be open and be open and be open. Yeah. 
somehow the image comes to mind of riding a bicycle, you know, where the only way to balance is to keep riding. You know, if you try to stop it and just, okay, I'm going to capture this point here on the street, boom, you're going to fall over. You have to kind of keep going to, and you can't use like the balancing that you did a minute ago to, to take care of what you're doing right now. <laughs> it's, it's just an ongoing thing. Yeah, this is, that's, that's the beauty of this is a momentum. Yeah. You know, we can kind of go from an awareness perspective, you can kind of argue that nothing's happening, but that's not really practical. So it's more like everything is in motion, energy is in motion, and aging is such a wonderful you know, like aging is so sweet. It's so obvious that I'm aging. Hmm. Like I can, I can come up with all kinds of philosophical perspectives, but the body's moving in one direction. So that, that's a great, to me, that's a great kind of grounding point in all of the philosophy. Like, oh yeah, the body's aging. Okay. Well, it stay, is, but you know close. what you just said about nothing happening. Don't, mm -hmm. you, don't you sense um, that as the body ages, uh, at the very same time, there is something which doesn't age, you know? I can I can see that, but I feel like that's kind of inferred from memory, mm. right? If I go if I go, there's one thing here that never moves. If anything I think spoken in time allows memory to have a little bit more of a say than I think it actually does in the immediacy of the experience. So I hear that as a point, but then I kind of like even then it's like I'm not sure because uh. I have to use my memories to make that point and. Where are they now? Where is my memories now? <laughs> yeah, but um, let's press this point a little bit. Yeah, I let's mean, play. Let's play. As We've been so nice to each other. Come on. Are we going to get nasty? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go nasty. You just wrestle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you'd probably whip my... Yeah, you're, you're tougher and younger. Speaking of aging, yeah, you're a lot yeah, stronger. Yeah. <laughs> um, just this point of there being, you know, I thought about this actually as I was listening to your videos because, you know, you have your, your, your perfect sign and now you're talking about aging and, um, and there is, it's like there, it's sort of like the simultaneously there are different paradoxical realities that are um, each true in its own right, although contradictory to the other coexisting realities. So, you know, it's like everything's perfect, okay? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, you, the body is aging and at a certain point you might have a stroke or a heart attack or something which may not seem so perfect. And, and you can actually take measures to help avert those sorts of things, eat mm -hmm. right, exercise, stuff like that. So, so everything's perfect doesn't mean just whatever happens. It means you actually do still have volition, you know, to steer you the course of life this way and that, or you appear to anyway. Sure. And then at the very same time, you know, there is a level of reality at which it's all unmanifest, transcendent, nothing ever happened, you know, there's no nothing is perfect because there's nothing to be perfect or imperfect. And all those things f kind of fit nicely together. And it's, it's, I think if we look at our experience, it's not just philosophical or hypothetical or theoretical. There's, you can sort of grok the, you can grok that within your experience, can't you? I think so too. I, I do think that there's a very because paradoxes only exist in language. I mean, if we shut up we're, and we're not talking to ourselves, there's not a paradox. Right. So it's like in some ways, it's there's a lot of ways to create these different angles, like a prism. You know, you're kind of turning it, and the light changes. Mm -hmm. But in the immediacy of this, sitting here together, there's not there's not much that's confusing. No. And that's the, that to me, that's always the, the sweet news. It's like, ah, oh, if, I, if I just shut up for a second on the inside, playing with my letters, everything's actually okay, even if it's not necessarily the greatest. It's okay. And yeah. I agree with you that, that perfection includes the nasty, and it includes the intelligence of taking a Tylenol when you have a headache and fixing your foot when you hurt it. And, yeah, you know, that, that's all part of it. And trying feeding to clean the starving up people exactly. and all yes, that kind of yes, stuff. Yeah. Of course. And also <laughs> included in that, though, is, is no, nah, fuck that. I'm going to do what I want. Because it's like from the position of a separate person, it looks like somebody's making all of these choices. And so it's easy to get into comparing. Yeah. But, but from a sort of like standing on the moon looking at the earth, it's just energy moving. And so mm. how, how involved do I want to get into that nitpicking? And how, just sort of how broad can I get and be like, yeah, okay, that's what happens here. I want to focus on the, on the love or I want to focus on feeding people, as you said, or being kind. Or, and that's what I love about being on the street is because everybody's there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a way that the spiritual circus, as I like to call it, and in a playful way and sometimes in a derogatory way, it, it's, there's a way that it can become kind of myopic. You know, like seeking can become really self-absorbed so that someone's mm -hmm. working on their own awakening. Oh, yeah. And meanwhile, they're passing people who are 
in some kind of need. And so it seems like balancing that out where it's like, yes, of course I'm looking for the wonder of my experience. And wow, what is this? And at the same time, hopefully, because it really does make a difference, I'm paying attention to my neighbors. And that yeah. seems very beneficial. Very beneficial. I mean, I've seen spiritual groups in which people become so self-absorbed and that they become downright cruel in a way. I mean, there's just, you know, complete sort of focus on one's own concerns and one's own, you know, how one is feeling and so on to the neglect of, uh, complete neglect of other people. And, and, you know, interestingly, there are spiritual teachers like, for instance, Amma, the hugging saint, who uh, makes a big deal of getting out and helping people, you know, go out, pick up trash, go out and help build this orphanage or whatever, because it kind of gets you out of that myopia that you referred to. Yeah, Sandra just told me a great story this morning. She's my partner, and she said that... Um on Facebook they posted this thing where this guy was in a village in Africa and he put a candy bar over at a tree and he lined the kids up and he says okay race towards it and whoever gets it wins mm -hmm. they all just held hands and uh, walked and sweet. walked and walked together uh -huh. and, and picked it up and shared it and they said well we can't just one of us we have to share it with all of us uh -huh. and that's that's really it to me that's the that's the crew that's it that's it that's everything that's the only awakening that matters is that moment of realizing we are all here together experiencing the same challenges, the same struggles, the same sufferings. How can we hold hands as best we can and share the resources and alleviate whatever we can of that? And, and I think it's an ongoing task for the rest of my life and I will fail at it. Hmm. But it's not, no, it's not up to just one person. It's seemingly it's up to all of us. And, but nobody's in charge too, so it gets into that fun area where it's like, you know, I don't want to live in a world where it's like, you have to help, you son of a bitch. You know, like, right. that doesn't work either. So it seems like there's a natural kind of love in our heart kind of moves us that way, some of us. Yeah, no, I think it's a beautiful point. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, what is awakening or realization? <laughs> it's, it's not just this little guy here kind of like having some great big wow experience. You know, it's, it's actually... Oh, an awakening to that which is universal and how can universal awareness have dawned and yet a person be sort of selfish and narrow-minded and you know all that it seems like inevitably there's going to be a greater broad-heartedness or open you know a tendency to I mean you can't account for personalities and there are exceptions to every generality sure, of course. You know, but again it, that does seem to be a, a trend toward people you know waking up and then wanting to you know, help others. Yeah. You know, in but that, what, that whatever is, way they choose to do so. I mean, sure, that's what it seems like, and it gets into that interesting conversation where does somebody actually wake up? Mm -hmm. You know, because that's sort of like is, awakening does not feel personal at all. Like, cause no. it's, it's so obvious that this was how the life was going to happen. It has nothing to do with Benjamin Smythe, and it's not somebody's experience. It's not my experience. It's the experience belongs to everything. And so that sort of, even, when, even if somebody looks like they wake up and then they're a jackass or they're, you know, whatever, it's like, that's part of it. I mean, we have to, we have to let chaos be chaotic in the conversation, otherwise it begins to get really confusing. But wait, it's supposed to, no, it's chaotic. Yeah. Okay, it's chaotic. Cool. What does my heart want to do? Because mm. to me, admitting it's chaotic ends the philosophy on the upstairs. So now it's like, move out of the haunted house. What does my heart want to do? Mm. And that's where, to, that's where all the conversation makes the most sense to me. How do well, I help somebody? How do I help somebody? How do I help? How do I help? What do you need? How can I help? What do you need? How can I help? <laughs> yeah. Well, that brings up two points. One is that there isn't a somebody who wakes up. That's right. you know contradiction in terms. And the second, well, I don't know what the second was. <laughs> um, hey, hey, just, wasn't it fun when you lose a thought? Like, where yeah. did you go? Uh, well, it's just kind of what we're saying is like there's a not, you know that saying in the Bible, my cup runneth over. I think it's in the 23rd Psalm. Mm -hmm. um, and once the cup is full... What does it do? What can it do? But overflow. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, seems, it seems that's sort of the, the benefit I find with the year perfect sign is it's not, it's not trying to make a broad statement about a personality so much as talk about the honesty of the, um, the immediate moment. Like right now everything's this way. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, if, I'm, if I feel it and there's a softening to it, and this is what people tell me anyway, then, then they kind of see it in other people and that feels to be the most beneficial thing is just sort of passing along the love. But recently I made a sign yesterday because I, I feel this sort of shift and, um, and I made a sign that says trust, love, and on the other side it says breathe easy. 
And that feels even more beautiful because it's less of an opinion. And I think it speaks right to a, the part of us that really feels intuitively that love is very trustable and that a nice way to deal with that is to just be easy when we are breathing and being with ourselves. Mm. Trust, so that, love and trust, breathe, love, breathe, breathe easy. easy. And it was really fun to see. Like, it was such a different thing because I think in some ways your perfect sign was a little bit for me. It was like, hey, see me. And, and yeah, it's for you too. But like... Benjamin Smythe's involved, and, and this feels like I'm not involved at all, and that feels, mm. it feels better personally because it's not, it's not personal. <laughs> uh, you could have made a sign that said, you're perfecter. <laughs> <laughs> Son of perfect. <laughs> that's great. I mean, the part of me that likes madness is like, that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, are you retiring the you're perfect sign? Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't yeah. know, but I, I don't have one right now. Yeah. And there's some, yeah, so... We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. You know, I kind of just follow orders, whatever that means. Let's talk about that because we've alluded to that, but um, maybe people don't quite realize what we're talking about. So for quite a few years, I guess, you know, you've spent quite a bit of time on the street or sitting in parks or whatever holding this big sign that says you're perfect. Mm -hmm. So what, what initially motivated you to do that and what sorts of interesting, you know, encounters have you had while doing that? In, in the year 2000, I was in Laguna Beach, California, and I passed by a guy, I was going to a bookstore, and I passed by a homeless man, and he was saying it to people. Mm -hmm. and, I, and he could say it in whatever language the person was walking by as. And so I went up to him, and I was like, well, you know, why are you doing that? And he said, well, I'm the only person I can't see. Huh. So if I say it to you, and you feel it, you show me what I look like. Hmm. And I really, that's something in there was so beautiful to me. So about five years later, I had a really crappy day, I was in San Francisco. And I made a sign, and I went out on Lincoln Avenue uh, by Golden Gate Park, and I sat down on the median there in between the traffic. And I was just sitting zazen. I wasn't even looking, or just, it was just resting against me. And then I hear this, excuse me, and this woman is crying. Mm -hmm. She says, thank you, I really needed to see that. Mm -hmm. And there was something in there that, you know, I, I thought this would make my day better by giving to others, and it did. It really worked. So I did a little more, and then... I put it away, and then in 2008, when I had this experience, I was like, oh, okay, it really is perfect. It really felt like, oh, it is perfect. I mean, it's a mess, and it's, it's an amazing mess. So then I just started going out more and more. And the greatest moments for me are when people come up, and they, they have those obvious challenges that we see socially, like they have an oxygen tank, or they have a limp, or you know, they're, they're missing an eye, or, and they're like, you know, thank you. You know, and, and it's not personal, and it's, it's very beautiful to just kind of like, yeah, well, you know, of course you are, of course you are, and to share that. And the other thing that's amazing is when children will drive by, and you don't even see the kid. You just see in the back seat there's this hand that shoots out of the window. Uh -huh. and it's this little hand, and it waves, and I can't see his face or anything, and it has that moment of, of just even, you know, touching the little ones. And so it feels, it just has that quality where it feels very beautiful. And, and I love being on the street because it's not pretentious. You know, the street is everybody. Yeah. You know, like the street is, is everyone, and, and that's, that feels very important because it's very easy to kind of get into the subculture of satsang mm -hmm. and, and miss out on the fact that everybody who goes to Walmart is part of the conversation, and everyone who goes to the ball game is part of the conversation, and everyone who struggles at their day is part of the conversation. So I, I like that it keeps, it keeps this really wide open and keeps me from, I think, becoming full of shit, you know, in some ways. Mm. That's but I could nice. be full of shit now, so I don't know. You know, I don't know. <laughs> well, at least you're colon. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But I had to eat last night. <laughs> Hot tamales. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny about people on the street. You know, they send the, people send around these emails and, uh, that say, it's like the people of Walmart, you know, and it has all these photos of people dressed oh, up, yeah, dressed yeah, outlandishly yeah. or you know really o overweight and stuff and I always feel I don't forward I have a humor list but I actually don't forward those on because I sort of feel bad about it uh, I, it's like it's like you're making fun of people um, and it's, it's nice to see actually that there's a growing national awareness against making fun of people for who they mm -hmm. are you know <laughs> Lady Gaga's got her her uh, campaign going for um, Bo born that way or born this way Fe foundation and Oprah's really into it and this new movie just came out called bully which is uh, trying to raise awareness of the issue of children bullying each other in school mm -hmm. and the suicides that have resulted from that and stuff and th so there seems to be a sort of a dawning appreciation of the need to just kind of appreciate people as they are and not judge them or uh, condemn them for being different or, you know, whatever. Yeah, I think that it's fun to look at, like, why would I do that anyway? 
like it's great to hear about these campaigns and I love looking close like what really like does it even feel good yeah. to, to make fun of somebody and it's sometimes with friends you know we're playful and we joke and we banter and, and yeah. humor can be humor has its place you know there's a place for comedy but in that really kind of like pointed attacking way it, it's mm-hmm. just there's no reason for that mm-hmm. there really is no reason for that as far as I can see and I've done it and, I'm, and I'm, I assume at some point in a moment of unconsciousness I'll do it again but if I can remember like there's not a reason to make fun of somebody yeah the way Ama puts it it's like uh, having a knife without a handle that's sharp on both ends <laughs> awesome. you're stabbing somebody but you're injuring your hand at the same time <laughs> awesome awesome so beautiful yeah. so beautiful yeah because I mean why would I make fun of myself yeah, you know, if I, if 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 I'm the one face I can't see, then all the other faces show me who I am. So why would I make fun of myself? It doesn't make any sense. And if we're really all the same self, ultimately, just expressing itself yeah. or being re- shining through different uh, lenses, then who's making fun of whom? You know. Right. Right. Huh. That's nice. where the, the heart matters. I think it really matters to to live from the heart. Yeah. And it's it's not always you know it's not glamorous you know sometimes it's kindness and patience and quietness and you know it's not flashy to be kind to people it's it's ordinary a smile goes a long way mm. you know and, and, and beautifully too in that mirror neuron way where the brains are firing whatever they're seeing and in some kind of percentage like a smile when I smile some part of you actually smiles in the, on the inside sure you know, underneath the emotion of whatever's going on and when you do it the same over here so how amazing walk down the street and just throw smiles at people you know, not that they need them, not for any kind of agenda way, but literally because it happens. Like, smile, 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 smile. Yeah. I was in Sweden, and I was holding the sign, and this man came up to me, and he was like, fuck you, motherfucker, fuck you, fuck you. And he was in, <laughs> he was in my face, and he was like, I want to fucking kill you, I want to fucking kill you. And I was just like, hallelujah, <laughs> hallelujah. You were singing? Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I just kept singing as he was saying that. And at one point, he just stopped. And he saw, I saw him stop. I saw whatever that was just stop. Mm-hmm. You know, and he said, wow, thank you so much. And I saw, I love you. Wow. And he walked away. And it was like, it's, cool. it's, that. it's that moment of being willing to love in the face of what looks terrifying and find out if it really is terrifying. Mm. And obviously there are moments where that's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but but it's I think we all have the courage and we all have the bravery to see what love can actually do. That's beautiful. It's kind of like turn the other cheek as Christ put it, you know. Yeah, which is fun because my friend in New York, um Christy, she's great and she said, you know, in in the in her tradition, I think it's the Greek Greek Orthodox tradition or the Eastern Orthodox tradition, turn the other cheek means try it again, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a fun take on that. You know, we usually think turn the other cheek as in hit me again, right. but it's more like see if you can get away with that again. Huh. And I love that interpretation. It kind of opens the gates because Christ sat down and fashioned a whip. You know, we have to remember that the Prince of Peace, if we're going to play with this metaphor, had oh, a in order to go where, into the money changers and yeah. he sat down and he made a weapon. So let's rem- you know, it's useful in that conversation of Christ being this model to remember that even he has moments of of anger and weakness oh yeah and if if it was even weakness um i mean if we if we look to the vedic tradition in the gita arjuna sat down in his chariot and said i don't want to fight these guys these are my relatives and krishna who is supposedly the incarnation of god said no you have to uh you know so get over it realize that you know they're already I've already killed him <laughs> in reality, and do your dharma and you know, do your duty. So, I mean, World War II, we wouldn't have just said, ah, oh, Hitler, well, you know, whatever, we'll just turn the other cheek and maybe he'll go away. We had to sort of get in there and do something about it. Well, there's always a, there's a, there's ways to do something about it, I think, mm-hmm. that are broader than the kind of either or of, I either am in Gandhi's way, like totally passive, or I'm obviously an, an actual aggressor. And I don't think there's ever a reason for violence. And, and there's there's got to be other ways and, and I might personally right now in my life I'm sort of playing with how else can we address the concern of violence because human to human violence is the is the saddest problem on earth because disease okay we got disease we deal with that natural disaster sure you know that we can do our best with those but but the fact that we attack each other that's just that's so sad and I know I've done it and, and I'm not I'm not I'm immune to it myself but there's something in, in, as in my experience right now, it's just like, is there any way that we can stop doing that? And I think 
just sharing like this and, and remembering like, wow, we are connected and we are connected and why would I hurt myself and why would I hurt myself? I don't have hope that, oh, again, eventually it'll all end, but, but it seems like we really can do stuff. And with information technology now, we can get to each other a lot faster with a lot, um, a lot of our ideas and a lot of our stories that are inspiring. And so it does seem that in some ways that works, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, I guess it, it was again Gandhi, whom you just mentioned, I think, who said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and eventually we'll all be blind <laughs> and yeah. toothless, I guess. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I mean, we can. This is getting off into speculation and opinion, but it, and I'm certainly not advocating violence myself. And what else is there? <laughs> it's, it's not my tendency, but um, it, it, it almost to play devil's advocate. It almost seems like there are certain circumstances where you sort of have to, you know, stand up to uh, an aggressor in an aggressive mm -hmm. way because he's just not going to go with subtlety. You know, he's just not going to. Uh, say, okay, you seem like a nice guy. I guess I'll just give up this endeavor and go back to my little country. You know, that some people are just wired as such that. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I think yeah. there's a, there's a sword and there's a net. You know, yeah. I think there's a way to have net strategies, which is to isolate it so that it's only left with itself as opposed to destroy it. And doing time, doing vipassana is a beautiful documentary about. You know, meditation within a prison and how the, the prisoners had a great transformation. They're hugging the guards when they come out. So there, there are these ways where we can kind of net something and then seemingly love it to the degree that it, it, it releases its own aggression. But I know that these are speculative strategies. Yeah. I hope we haven't bored people with this tangent we've gone off on, but it's kind of interesting to just let it go where it goes and, you know, see what we, what we cover, uncover. I want to talk about the same stuff every week. Um, now let's let's talk a little bit about. I love this sort of heart orientation thing that you've been talking about. You know, uh, it's like settling down from your head to your heart and tuning into that and acting from there and stuff. Let's let's talk about that whole thing a little bit more. The the importance to me of of love is is that it's so obvious that it's necessary. Mm -hmm. When I'm out in the, when I'm out in the world, even now, you know, like kindness, kindness resonates, like enthusiasm. You know, it's like enthusiasm. Wow, and it resonates. And kindness has that same resonation. And and there are so many kind of old paradigms, not to get too philosophical, but there's so many old strategies that just aren't working anymore. You know, there's more of us, and 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 kindness, and and being good to each other, and being compassionate to each other and helping each other out is going to be such a useful strategy for solving some of the challenges that the sheer number of us is going to create as time goes on. I mean, there's just more and more and more people. And the Earth has not necessarily l unlimited resources, but it has, you know, it has some limits. And we're going to hit those limits, obviously. And the sharing and the kindness, that story of the kids holding hands, I mean, it really comes down to that. It's like being willing to notice that we're all here together. So Maybe I can have a little less. I can simplify my life to have a little less so that when things come my way, I can give them a little more. That's what I find mm -hmm. happens here. And not that this is about right or wrong or should or shouldn't, but just what feels the best. If I wake up every day and I go and I, and I do only what I want to do, which I've done before, and I think there's something valuable to that, okay, at some point it's like, okay, well, what else? The next greatest feeling, selfishly, I can find is to, is to share with others and to be kind to others. So I think there's a way that altruism can kind of be forced, like you need to be good to other people to the point where you're like, you don't even learn what you like or how you like to be. So it seems like selfishness is useful, but if selfishness is taken all the way through, it's going to lead to, oh wow, we're all here. Mm. And then the best feeling I can find selfishly is to love and to care about other people. And so that feels, that feels useful, especially seemingly with the coming challenges of, of resources, and, which may or may not happen. I mean, this is the thing, this is so fun. You know, I can only kind of speculate from what I know and I don't know everything. That's an interesting point. It's it's that old golden rule: do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's um, it may seem altruistic, but it actually is self-serving in a way. I mean, when like we were saying before, with a knife that's sharp on both ends, or if you're mean to somebody, it makes you feel bad. It's like um, you know, you're the prime beneficiary when you are helping others. It's like it's that's not maybe your motivation, but right. that that's the outcome. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the natural result. It's, uh, 
it's like a teacher. He teaches in a classroom. You've, you've been a teacher in classrooms. And uh, who learns the most? It's actually the teacher mm -hmm. who's, who's, who's learning the most. <laughs> well, yeah. he's teaching, the students are learning, but he's the prime <laughs> beneficiary. If he's listening. If he's listening to the students, he's learning yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We're all, I love that there's those moments when teaching where it's like, wow, we're all learning together. Mm -hmm. You know, like being able to say, I know, I don't know, I'll look that up and I'll get back to you. You know, just like, hey, let's look that up together. There's these great moments where like, and this is something that happens in the spiritual conversation too, where the hierarchy can actually just be like just equalized. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all here together. The guy in the chair, the girl in the chair, the one who's awakened is equal, equally decaying, equally, you know, experiencing the air as the people sitting below and, and sort of trying to learn about that experience. And so it seems so important for me to continue to make sure that that equality is emphasized because it, anything else just doesn't, it just feels like bullshit because we're all here together. It yeah. does not matter who's had what experience. We're all here together and that feels very important to say. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's again, it's a both and kind of situation um, where like if I go to see the Chicago Bulls play basketball, uh, in some respect I'm equal to those players, but I'm not an equal basketball player, um, <laughs> you know. So, sure. you know, they're, the guy in the chair might be more eloquent, better able to articulate, and so on. But what he's attempting to articulate is that which everyone is is, is completely immersed in anyway. You know, maybe he has a little bit more clarity about it, but um, you know, we're all fish swimming in the same ocean. Yeah. I see that, you know, it kind of comes down to the setup, but like that you bring up the, 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 the ball game because, you know, like within the realm of competition, mm -hmm. yes, you're not, you're not going to get a jersey. But within the realm of playing together and sort of reducing that need to kind of compete, well then why can't we all just throw the ball around together and have fun? And so it seems like there's a time and a place for all of that. Com competition is a very funny thing, especially when it comes to sports, because everything has to be agreed upon in order for the game to happen. Meaning we cooperate on every single rule and then we go, okay, I won. Even though we're cooperating the entire time. Yeah. Like if you go out of bounds, you have to, you know, like it's totally made up theater mm -hmm. and then it, we pretend to compete. And it's a big business and it, you know, it has its fun. I love watching, you know, right now the final four, I think it's on today, you know, it's like, okay, cool. You know, like it's part of the fun, but it's also a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a silliness. Mm -hmm. This idea that like somebody can actually win something when we're cooperating the entire time. Mm -hmm. and, and in some ways that's sort of satsang, like you don't win enlightenment, you don't win awakening, you know, we're cooperating the entire time, we're agreeing that such a thing is possible. You know, the satsang is such a, it's a setup because everybody who walks in, it's already decided what this experience is. You know, we're, we're all doing this. Well, it's like, okay, well what if we just all sit down and hang out together as equals and not talk about satsang and just like share our day? You know, and you hear that sometimes, you know, I notice in, in the sharings I do that, you know, it's, it's like that dance between group therapy and, and like community organization and then seemingly some kind of spiritual conversation. Hmm. But it really comes down to what are, we, what are we trying to create here? Because we are all creating it together. You could easily walk into a satsang and just bring checkers. You know, like there's no fucking rules. Like there's no rules. We're really playing and creating this together over and over and over again. So are, the thing I think that's useful is, am I aware that I'm doing that? Because then when I walk in, maybe I'll walk in without my setups and see, well, what actually is going on? Let's look at this from a different angle. When someone goes into a group and they, you know, seemingly there's somebody who has some kind of experience or like you said, that eloquence. Like, well, how else can I see this? There was this great picture one time. There was a picture of um, people in an Iranian mental hospital. And then there were a picture of people in a temple praying. And if you put them next to each other, there's no way to tell the difference what they're doing. <laughs> and I think that is, that's really it. Like, if, you, if everybody dressed up in, in, if everyone was giving a satsang in a mental hospital and you were videotaping it, w w is that, is that going to be taken as seriously as if you do it at the Hyatt? You know, like, it's the setup of the whole thing that kind of creates the context for what we think is happening. And I think that's very useful to play with because in that both end way, like, wait, what else could this be? What else could this be? Hmm. Maybe there's no awakening. Maybe there's just a bunch of theater going on. What else could this be? That seems to be a very useful thing to ask. I've noticed in my life all the time, I, I'm able to see something a little bit differently when I ask that. Because it unpacks the learning and the conditioning and the, and the social ideas of what this is and what is going on.
Because if I just believe, if I just believe without playing, then then I could easily just be kind of caught up in chasing after somebody else's idea. Whenever I ponder any of this stuff, like listening to you for the last couple of minutes, I just find my uh, awareness kind of swinging from kind of like a whole range of possibilities. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I find myself accepting what's being said, but but kind of being reminded of the infomercials where they say, but wait, there's more, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, well, like, think, yeah, totally. it's like, okay, yes, this, but also this. Yes, this. of course. It's, of it's course. like, because it's, it's almost like, you know that, uh, what is it called, that thing in physics where you, uh, you know, the, the light thing is not a particle or a wave until the observer observes it and then it sort of focuses, Schrodinger's uh, experiment, I don't know, Hi, one of those guys. Yes. <laughs> but uh, it's almost like when we when we have to say something about mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. we we kind of congeal it down into one of a myriad of possibilities yeah um That's exactly just, be, what just I mean. because of the, the mechanics of human understanding and speech and so on and you know if we can do that and simultaneously at least in the background keep an appreciation of the the vast myriad of possibilities that we're not expressing at this moment that's kind of cool mm -hmm. for sure and I agree with you like wait there's more yeah and that's 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 just it it's just okay how else can I look at this and play with it and and what's beautiful is what that's all like like you were saying like kind of all about an understanding well what isn't an understanding mm. Yeah, I've actually had people accuse me of being wishy-washy because I seem to agree with all my guests, even though they're all saying slightly different things. And they, say, yeah, 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 they, they think I'm just being kind of like a conciliatory or something like that. Why don't you take a stand? Why don't you sort of, you know, try to change their, you know, and, but it's like... Well, we can do that. It's, it's the, no, I wouldn't want to. It's, oh, we're okay, all, but I'm just saying all, we could play, you know. Well, we're, we're all blind men feeling the elephant. It, it is a wall. It is, it is a trunk. It is a snake. You know, it's, it's all those things, um, depending on which part you happen to be feeling at the moment. Well, that's a fun comment because in some ways tension is interesting. You know, we kind of live in a world where, oh, tension, tension, you know, tension keeps us interested. Mm -hmm. Because if we're just sort of here... And we're, you know, we're playful. Well, that's sort of everybody's experience is kind of like that sort of bland ordinariness. So it's like, well, let's create some tension. But what's fun is that's what keeps all of the sort of struggles going, is that need for the tension. No, I can't just relax. Because if I relax, it's almost like everything's okay. And if everything's okay, it's almost like I don't exist. Well, you know, it's the old both and thing again. Uh, tension and relaxation simultaneously. It's, it's like uh, manifestation, specification concretization and simultaneous you know the simultaneous opposite of all those is the way the universe works it's like it's I don't know how the universe works it's specific it's universal <laughs> yeah. you know it's yeah. concrete it's it's abstract it's material it's non-material both at once yeah and weird little embodiments of that mm-hmm mm. and then sometimes <laughs> no I agree with you and then sometimes you know if we if we can kind of move away from the words you know, then there's that sort of immediacy, and you know, you've meditated. There's that immediacy of awareness, or that immediacy yes. of, of being. You know, it's not a word; it's this. Mm -hmm. And so that's that feels like that's what's so great about as the conversation feels interesting. There's something that's even more interesting. Unfortunately, it's not entertaining, even though it's amazing. It's, so, it's such a private thing. And you know, in, in, in an interview, it's called dead air. You know, we're not just gonna be quiet together because that's not necessarily. But we could. But I mean, that's the thing. It's like the conversation that we're having is really about. Yeah. <laughs> I did that in the Mariana Kaplan interview that I did a few a month ago. She, I, I made some point. She said, "Let's just be quiet for a minute and let that sink in." And we just kind of sat there for a little while. You know, uh, obviously, if we did that the whole time, nobody would watch these because they can go do that by themselves. Well, there's, you know, I want to say there's something about seeing people being at ease mm -hmm. that is is interesting to watch. I don't know. I know I get this feedback. There's moments in my videos where there's some quiet, and some people. There are many people who are like, oh, you know, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> and so that might be true here. You know, there's nothing wrong with silence. I, I sometimes, you know, the constant need to kind of have the mind be involved or sort of the language be involved. There's no right or wrong to it, but it is nice when we rest because that's what we want, right? To rest. Yeah. <laughs> to just be able to relax for a second. Yeah. And do you find? 
Sorry to violate the. Oh me. no worries. But, no no no. We can't but, we can't screw it up. Well, because you know I'm I'm wired. But uh, <laughs> do do you find that um, there's a simultaneous in your life in general, not necessarily even right now, but all the time that there's there's a simultaneous relaxation and. I don't want to use the word tension, but in, in the midst of your most dynamic situations, let's say you're you're late for a flight, you're running through an airport trying to get well, to the happens, yeah. yeah get trying to get to the other gate, and don't you notice that I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that there's a, a sort of an, an ease and a relaxation and a silence in the midst of the chaos of the airport and the urgency to catch the connection and so on. That the two can coexist paradoxically. I don't know because I think that takes. I mean, yes, I can see that in theory. In the moment, the moment sort of the moment's happening like this. Yeah. Like you know, like we're, the words are falling out and we're playing. I don't know what I'm going to say next. I don't even know how this is really working. <laughs> and so I could, I can't. Can I, can we stop right here and even find that in the immediacy of the experience? I can find it in the in the after the fact, mm. but in the immediacy, I don't know. It's not necessarily but, there. Okay. And that's the thing where it's like it's like silence is in motion. You know, silence is having the conversation. Yeah. You know, in a poetic way, or the universe is having, or nothing is having a conversation pretending to be everything. Like, that's still kind of this philosophical perspective. And that's, that's what it seems like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just happening in that way. Okay. But when I was in the airport, I was just in the airport, and I, I was late. I was like, and I, had to, I was that guy who was like, you know, 50 people back, and I was like, I got to catch a flight. Can I cut in front of all of you, you know? And it was just like, <laughs> sure. And it's like, okay, thank you, you know? And like, yeah. it's great to be that person, hit that, that sort of social weirdness. You know, it was a little like, uh oh, well, we'll we'll just play and see what happens. Do you find that um it's almost as though over time you're um becoming a kinder person? You we've mentioned kindness, but is it are you like plumbing the depths of deeper and deeper kindness? Well I don't know if you know yeah, I mean I think that gets into that, you know, there's always more to learn. Mm -hmm. But I definitely I notice I notice it's easier for me, you know, I don't have much money and I notice it's easier for me to, to when it comes my way to give it to somebody else who really needs it. I had this wonderful conversation with this man on Skype yesterday. I talked with people, and, and, um, and he's like, I'd like to make a donation. And I said, well, whatever amount you're going to give me, just break it up into $5 bills and go out onto the street and give it to somebody who really needs it and look them in the eyes and say, I love you. And that felt like the most amazing way that he could give to me was just to like, go out into the world and, and learn how wonderful it is to give to other people. There's a reality. I do need money, but I, right now I have, as, I have as much as I need, and so it's not a big deal. But That's the, sweet. Well, it's, it's important because the minute I'm making money off of people's suffering and I'm kind of like keeping that going, I'm, I, for me personally, and I know that everyone has a different view on this, but for me personally, I'm absolutely out of integrity. Hmm. You know, I cannot simultaneously talk about freedom and then not be willing to, to just kind of like have nothing. You know, like what do I know then? What do I know if I'm not willing to give up everything I own and, and be available to everyone? But this is, this is, you know, this is, again, this is my perspective, and so I know that it's, it's extreme, yeah. but I really... It, also de it's sort of, it is a perspective. I mean, you know, everybody uh, gets paid for their work, usually, in our society, and some people, I think, get paid way out of proportion with what they're actually contributing, uh, and, pr and, and others way under proportion to what they're actually contributing, you know? Uh, like, teachers should get paid a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but um, nonetheless if they didn't get paid they wouldn't be able to do what they're doing in many cases and in your case let's say if you didn't have any money whatsoever you'd probably have to get a job and then you wouldn't be able to do what you do all day which is helpful to people which not that many people are doing so there's nothing you shouldn't feel guilty about getting some kind of financial remuneration if if it's offered you know in the right spirit yeah i agree i don't feel any guilt with that cuz i ask for money when i need it mm -hmm. but i also notice that you know there's there's so many different ways to share, you know, and having a job and going to a job is, is one of those ways, you know, like, it just feels like if I'm, if I'm, if the thing I'm focusing the most on is love, mm -hmm. rather than some sort of sense of my freedom, then that can happen at the grocery store, that can happen at the, you know, office, that can happen at the Department of Public Works, driving around in a truck, you know, I mean, I've had different jobs, and I expect to have a job again, I can't do this I don't see myself doing this forever because it's important to stop being this guy and go into the world and, and be in the world in that way and then you know but right now this is this little window where I, I seem to do this and yeah you know I, I, I don't see myself doing it long term 
that's what I love about being on the street is like I can give up all of the stuff that happens on the internet I can give up the meetings and and go have a job and then every day and for a little bit of time I can go out on the street and do the same thing I do now mm-hmm. you know it's like this is about living an, an ongoing authentic life it's not really about trying to get away with anything which sometimes it feels that way I feel like wow really I feel so lucky you know I get to go around the world and talk with people and, and it just feels like you know I want to make sure that I'm honoring the reality of that fortunate experience which I try to do but I think I can always do better <laughs> do people uh, actually pay your way to go flying here and there to, to talk to them yeah they I do this thing where I live with people for a week and so mm-hmm. I got to, I went to Europe for two months in Australia New Zealand and then around America and and so they just they just have to pay for the flight and then I am I happily do chores and help out and you know it's not just laying in the corner you know like I'm just like I try to be involved and and just live with them I love that you know like a satsang in some ways you know the meetings are are their own little thing but living with each other for an entire week and you know pooping and shitting and eating and you know helping out with the cat and helping out with the kids and like all of the normal realities I think those things are so important to share together Mm. Because that's what life actually is. You know, we don't we don't live in a room in a bunch of chairs talking to each other about freedom. We have to go home and <laughs> clean our clean our garage and take care of our our business. So it's like, well, let's live inside the business together. And and I feel so honored. Everyone who's ever let me in their house, I just feel so honored. All the things I've gotten to learn from them. That's nice. That's cool. I kind of did that myself for many years when I was teaching. I, I didn't actually own a home or rent an apartment for a period of about 15 or 20 years. I was just traveling, living out of a suitcase, you know, going here and there. Huh. Did you like it? Yeah, I loved it. And it was a great phase of my life. It, it, it kind of, um, you just got very emotional saying that, didn't you, Ben? Oh, man, people are so amazing to me. It's very sweet. We're all we're all so amazing. Mm. We're just doing our best. Yeah, it's like this is <laughs> my my heart is is teaching me all kinds of things right now. Mm. Do you do a spiritual practice of any sort formally anymore, like some kind of zazen thing, or are you basically just living life and um, it's unfolding of its own? I still sit when I feel it. I don't necessarily have like a schedule, but mm. I definitely notice that I sit down sometimes and. And just sort of be in that still point. Yeah, in some of your videos, you were sort of saying that it's valuable to sort of spend some time in silence or whatever. Well, in the end, you know, it's that funny balance between this is this is about a private experience and it's about a, a, a universal experience, as as you say. I like that word. And so when I'm when I'm there on the cushion, just kind of looking at the wall and, and being in that place, then that's that's sort of gathering the energy to then go out and share some of that. I like what Suzuki Roshi says, you know, someone asked him once, he said, so there's nothing we have to do, and he goes, no, and that's why you must sit. (laughs) (laughs) And I really love that, that sort of, okay, there's nothing to do, let's make the nothing even more and more and more and more so that it's alive with love and it's alive with caring and compassion. Mm. Yeah, there's the analogy of if you want to shoot an arrow, first you have to pull it back on the bow. And then let go. You know, you don't just sort of hold it there and let go of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that sort of like deeper silence gives rise to greater sort of um, the opposite stroke, you know, greater dynamism or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's that importance of doing what, I think doing what we feel we have to do, doing what we feel we must do. Yeah. Do, doing the right thing. It comes back to just like, how can I be a good person? You know, I can spend hours in the sort of there's nobody here conversation and that has its own value and sort of releasing certain patterns from conditioning. But then, okay, cool. How can I be kind? How can I help? How can I share? And I, 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 I notice I'm just going to, this is the point. If there's any point I want to make, oh, this is the point. To just keep coming back to the honesty and the very practical, pragmatic reality of living together and caring for each other. That's great. I mean, it's unfortunate, but you know, in some cases, many of the teachers who've banged the drum of nobody here most loudly have ended up, you know, getting caught in circumstances which did not exactly display compassion and caring. You know, all kinds of funny things with money and sex and you know various difficulties. So, 
I think in a lot of I think there's a kind of a, a growing appreciation in the satsang community or the spiritual community that you have to sort of you know the nobody here thing can't be a cop out for not taking care of your humanness and your, your decency as a person that there could be a good deal of work yet to be done in that arena I think those those moments are really wonderful for the communities because it highlights the minute we set someone up in a hierarchical authority position mm -hmm. that it just highlights the, the, the sort of the awkwardness and the inefficiency of that. If we stay at equality, then it's like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, you had a little adultery or you had a little problem with money. Yeah, okay, you know, that happens here. Yeah. But when we're like, they know something and oh, you know, I think that sets up this weird imbalance because everyone's here together. You know, even the people who make seemingly those those errors of judgment or whatever, they're they're innocent. They're just believing their thoughts like the rest of us. So it's just so sweet that even the gurus and the teachers that have had those experiences, if I take away the belief that they're, they're anything special, well then of course they're just here. They're just like mom and dad and Uncle Steve and you know, like everybody who has their own problems and their own challenges in life. Plato has this great quote. He says, you know, be kind for everyone you see is fighting a great battle. Mm -hmm. And that includes the spiritual teacher. You know, they're fighting the battle of, of fame or admiration or that sort of personal social payoff from being touted as somebody who has something. You know, that's a, that's a powerful struggle and some people handle that very well and some people handle it in a way that's awkward for them. And so for, for everyone to remember, no matter who it, no matter who it is, yeah. that, that great battle is always going on no matter who it is. Yeah, like you said a while ago, everybody's doing the best they can. Definitely, including the, including the people, you know, I mean, I mean it's, it's that innocence of humanity, you know, we're totally innocent because we just, it's just thoughts, we're just believing thoughts, hmm. you know, and, and at some moments it's like one, one thought believed leads to a big ass problem like on Wall Street, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and another thought believed leads to like feeding somebody a sandwich or making cupcakes for a party or, you know, so it's just everyone's doing the same thing and that's where the hierarchy, it feels very useful to keep pointing out that that's not very, it's not helpful ultimately for seekers to hold up anyone because what they really what really works here is this sense that we're all here together we're all equal in our humanity in our in our suffering i mean suffering does bind us in that way that challenge binds us hmm. even if someone says they're beyond suffering you know it's like okay let me watch alex trebek has this great quote where he says you know don't tell me what you believe i'll watch your life and i'll decide for myself hmm. and i think there's something to that really like the integrity of that yeah not taking people at their word and just sort of observing them because well, I can say anything you know you, you gotta watch you gotta watch you gotta watch and that's what I love about living with people for a week mm -hmm. it's like it's pretty hard to be full of shit if you, if you see each other all day <laughs> yeah I think it says in the Bible you shall know them by their fruits yeah and then Ramdas said if you think you're enlightened go spend a week with your parents yeah <laughs> totally <laughs> yeah and yeah. It, yeah, there's nothing, I don't find any value to thinking any, I'm enlightened. I don't think find any value to thinking anyone's enlightened. Mm. You know, there's no reason for that. Just, just being a good person is enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, my wife talks about this kind of thing a lot, too. She feels very strongly that, you know, she, she like the Alex Trebek quote, you know, she just, she wants to see, see the, the proof of the pudding, um, you know, and not just sort of uh, any sort of self-proclaimed, subjective state or anything like that it, it needs to be if, if it's real uh, in uh, what you're saying it needs to percolate down into the nitty-gritty and if it doesn't then maybe there's some integration yet to be uh, accomplished sure and I think that opens up kind of like what is it what what is the it you know yeah. it's like is there is there something different than than just being good people together and kind of dealing with our own battles like does somebody ever have something that is really it you know this again is kind of part of the theater and I know what she's pointing to I'm sure mm -hmm. but it's still kind of fun like wait how much of the setup is being taken seriously well I think there is an it though I mean when you had that experience on the balcony uh, uh, wherever it was uh, there was a subjective shift if someone had been watching you at that moment nothing would have changed in your circumstances you're standing on the balcony and the stars are shining and so on but somehow your pers your subjective perspective changed and as you said it never really shifted back so and, and you know so I mean somebody like Christ for instance to take an extreme example he wasn't just a cool guy going around raising people from the dead and all there was something 
in his subjective development, you know, that, I mean, enlightenment, or if we want to use that word, it has so much baggage, but if we want to use it, 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 if you could sort of, if the average person, and I'll, I'll play devil's advocate with you here, if the average person, which is all of us, which is yep. all of us, the average if, person is all of us, you know, if, if, if the average guy on the street uh, sure. were, were to suddenly somehow magically pop in to the seeing the world as Ramana Maharshi saw it or as Christ saw it or something, I think there would be a dramatic contrast. It's like, so I mean, that's what this whole spiritual game is about. It's not just sort of the symptoms in terms of kindness and good feelings, and, you know, nice behavior and all that. I think n not to demean those. I mean, those are very important. But it's, it's really the whole thing is about a sort of a, uh, a subjective development, a, a shift in, in our internal realization. Words are difficult to, to capture it, but uh, would you agree or not? I agree to the idea of it, and then when it comes down to it, you know, we don't actually know. what I don't know what anyone else actually experiences. You know, I, I can see the outside, I can, I can watch you, and, and I can see that. But when it comes to this sort of idea of a shift, this is the other thing, like, I don't find it very useful to believe that at all, because in the end, it's, it's here we are. And, and I have to do my best. And I can believe that Ramana had something different than the guy at the gas station or the Dalai Lama's experiencing something different than you know, the guy at the, on, the, on the Bulls team. But, but I don't know what the value of that is. And I'm still open to exploring it. I hear, the, I hear the point you're making, but I really don't understand the value of comparing other people's experiences. Because in the end, this is the one that I'm living with and everything that I can touch and experience and influence is right here. Well, it's not, to it's not to compare for the sake of saying that Ramana Harshi was better than the guy in the gas station or anything like that. Um, and I think we can talk about this without implying some sort of um, holier-than-thou or, you know, superior-inferior kind of hierarchy. Um, but the whole history of spirituality, I'm just saying, is not just about sort of good works, you know, and being a nice person and stuff. It's, uh, although that's part of it, and in, in, in many cases that's, pers that's pers referred to both as a symptom of spiritual development and as a technique to facilitate it. You know, if you do good stuff, it helps to culture your, your you know, make you more um, worthy or, sus or susceptible to spiritual awakening. But there is this sort of subjective component uh, that has traditionally always been part of it, um, which can be very, very profound, and and which in t and and can actually serve the purpose of just what you're saying. It's like we we're saying. Be well, to take an example. I mean, a guy who can't swim, if somebody's drowning, he can't help him very much. Um, if he if he's, he learns to become a good swimmer, then he can m become a lifeguard or something. So um, there, if if there is a profound inner realization. Maybe that can be, it can have a utilitarian purpose. You know, it can enable a person. It can, that can be contagious, mm -hmm. uh, and as it spreads contagiously, um, it's going to enhance the lives of many people, making them better not only in terms of their inner happiness. I mean, I've heard you give whole videos about the happiness is to be found within, not just in terms of external experiences. So enhancing not only that, but also enhancing their ability to, you know, the, the, the likelihood of their helping the guy on the street who's having a hard time or, you know, volunteering at the soup kitchen or, you know, doing something to, to on a practical level to benefit humanity. Yeah. I hear that, and I notice that there's lots of people, and I, and I agree, I, I just am very skeptical with subjective, like, s reports of experiences, it doesn't help to believe that. I really did, I'm just, because I don't... No, I'm not saying that. And you I know. know that's not what you're saying, but yeah. I agree that there's something that can happen, and it can have an effect out in the world. Yeah. But I have a feeling that, like, single mothers right now, and, and elderly people all over the world, and, like, all of that's already happening. Mm -hmm. Like, there are people who are simply just living a, a good life, Kindly, you know, not believing too much of the the noise that they learned from school, society, church. They're all over the world, and then there's this conversation about about a special one of those, and I think that's the that's the thing that kind of keeps it from. Oh wow, my everybody's like this. Everybody has this exact same potential and experience of 
sharing what matters to them and what va what they value and what they care about. Well, the whole name of this show, Buddha at the Gas Pump, implies, you know, that in the most ordinary of circumstances, you're going to encounter so-called awakened people these days. Yeah, yeah. And the subtitle of this show is, you know, interviews with ordinary spiritually awakened people. So oh. I'm I'm hip to your whole thing of you know what you're trying to say here. Yeah. Um, I'm just sort of uh, playing the both and card and, and saying that it's you don't have to sort of exclude the significance of the subjective development while emphasizing the value of uh, caring and sharing and helping and, and all that stuff. The, the two can go hand in hand and in fact they complement one another. Yeah. I see and, that. And again, you know, it's not a matter of believing it. No, I know, because you know, that's not going to do you any good. No, I, that's that's my point. That's all my yeah, point is. is yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter do what you believe. believe that Ramana Harshi has having a special experience. It doesn't yeah, it's, it's, do anybody. Yeah, it's like uh, looking at a restaurant and saying, "I believe and I've heard that they have really good food in there." You could starve to death sitting on the sidewalk doing that. You know. Yes. <laughs> you, you have to actually eat the food. To, yes. <laughs> to, yes. And so, so that's what it's all about. I mean, definitely. <laughs> You know, having the experience yourself, or this whatever, uh, in the restaurant example, or in the in the case, I mean, Ramana Maharshi didn't want people to believe that he was having some cool experience, you know, level of life. He wanted them to experience it just as he experienced it, or yeah. as Christ as Christ said, you know, whatsoever great things I do, even greater things shall you do, you know. Um, so all these guys, uh, if they're genuine and if they if they have integrity, as we started out this interview talking about, um, they're you know, they're not just trying to... It, well, you know, I mean, I can see why you'd feel this because religion has, to a great extent, devolved into the whole emphasis is on believing stuff that you don't necessarily experience. And, and gathering notes from people you don't actually get to live with. Yeah. I don't and, know anything about Ramana Maharshi. I don't know anything about anyone who's dead. All I know is words about their lives. Mm -hmm. I want to I see, I want to spend time with you. I want to spend time with the people that are alive today. I want to be out in the world with people who I can actually touch and breathe next to and feel. Because everyone who's dead, has all they've left behind are pictures and letters. And I don't know how that helps anyone. Yeah. As, as somebody said, dead gurus don't kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, they grow flowers though <laughs> right yeah anyway I think everybody gets the point and mm. we're, I think we're basically in agreement it doesn't matter whether we are or not but sure. um, you know the importance just... the importance for me is is that I don't I can't see the value and I'm, I'm only speaking for myself I don't see the value in believing that anyone is having a special experience no I don't see the value of that either any more than Except perhaps in a theoretical way, you know the way uh, the way science works. You take a theory, and you know you don't really believe in the theory. It's just sort of a theory, and you're going to test to see whether it's valid or not. So you do all these experiments, and you see how it turns out. And it might turn out one way, or it might turn out the opposite way. You're not supposed to have a vested interest if you're really a scientist. Right. Uh, uh, so you know all this this talk of higher states and. Yeah, states. yeah. It's, a th it's an interesting theory. Totally. And, and if you want to investigate it, fine. Do some experiments, whatever, mm -hmm. however you choose to do them, and we'll s you'll end up finding out whether it's true or not. Yes, and that's the key, is, yeah. is, is I have to actually do the experiments. Yeah. I have to do them. I have to, I have to be willing. Whatever it is I'm trying to find, I have to be willing to shut the fuck up and sit down and get quiet and find out if there's anything in here that's really, really scary or terrifying or I have to run from. Because mm -hmm. I can believe, I can add letters upon letters upon letters, and in the end what I really want is to be able to sit in the world as I am without any fear. That's what anybody wants. I mean, I seem, I seem, it, it seems like the only thing anybody wants is to be able to actually relax in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, that cannot be found in letters and piles and piles of letters. I can only do that if I get quiet and I sit still and I wade through and it could be terrifying and it could be scary and it could be maddening. I wade through all of the beliefs of yesterday that I think are still happening. And then I land here in the chair and there's no yesterday to be found. There's just this amazing tingling aliveness that I know nothing about. I have
have to be willing to give up the conversation to find out what's being talked about. I just got a little re warning. Re <laughs> My computer said, "Warning! There's no volume. There's no not, not, your, your mic might not be working." <laughs> right. Even the computer is scared of silence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing to fear. Yeah. No, that was good. I no, mean, thank you. I appreciate. I appreciate that you gave a little space for that because it really does. It really is the meat of the the meat of the whole conversation is is the opposite of talking about it. Yeah, and I think I really understand what you're saying now. I mean, all the talk and all the words and all that is just sort of surface chatter, and and it and its only value, if any, is to point to something, is to point to the real thing, which is far beyond the level of chatter. Well, it's yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's not really. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Language is, language is a wonderful tool that is inefficient for one thing, and that's describing what this is. Yeah. It's that Adyashanti always says, you know, I, I, I do the best I can, I know I'm going to fail, I just try my best to fail well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Does a, he does a good job failing well. His, note, his notes have been very helpful for me with regards to the body stuff, you know, certain body conditions kind of change because motivations are lost and mm -hmm. you know I was an athlete and then I, well, I don't care anymore and and so I remember encountering um, I was in London at a friend's house and I just opened one of his books and there was this page about you know just being willing to trust that the body will break down and, and kind of change in its own accord and and that's the one thing from him that I found like really valuable I, I appreciated his notes on that and yeah. that's the that's the beauty of the conversation like you're saying you know it's, it's good to share our notes Mm -hmm. You know, speculation is a little tricky, but what's actually happening with us feels very useful to share because everyone has a different thing. I worked with these older men, you know, they were in their 60s and they're like, well, when you get to be my age, you'll have a colonoscopy and it'll be like this, you know, and so I, like, I feel all prepped. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm in my 60s. <laughs> hey, you know, I mean, there's certain things that because of age, aging is the reality we have to deal with. So there's certain stages of aging that allow us to, hey, you know, this might come to you, this might come to you, and that feels very useful. And, and in this conversation of looking into the the sort of the silent experience of ourselves, some of our notes can be useful, mostly around fear, excuse me, yeah. fear and what happens with the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also I think it's, um, I, I mean, I get a lot of feedback from people who listen to these interviews and they say that it really helps them to kind of hear this whole variety of uh, different people's experience because it, it enables them not to put people on a pedestal. I mean, you know, I, I get feedback from people saying, holy mackerel, you know, it's like this is happening to average Joes like me. This is happening to everybody. And I, I feel so um, much more optimistic now about my possibilities and about my life. And, yeah. And that's the usefulness of it is that, you know, the, the face looks different or the tone is different or even the personality expression is different. But what's being talked about is exactly the same. And hilariously, it's available the minute I'm willing to shut up. No matter who I am, it's available the minute I'm willing to just. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's not. It's not profound, and it's necessarily not necessarily entertaining, but it's available constantly for everyone at any moment. It's the opposite of trying to figure out what this is. Yeah. When you uh, settle down like that, though, um, you were talking about the body a minute ago. Do you notice that there um, may be some kind of agitation in the body someplace, some tension in the head or some kind of uh, turbulence in the heart or whatever, and that your, your attention is kind of naturally drawn to that and it helps to facilitate the dissolving of it? Mm -hmm, definitely. I had a huge knot in my stomach. It felt like a, an energetic knot in the middle of the night, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of like, you know, just looking at it without trying to get rid of it or move towards or away. Just, just look at it. And it just sort of, you know, that softens on its own. Mm -hmm. Seemingly like awareness, which we use the word for whatever that attention is. Attention is fascinating. Mm -hmm. 
it's it's like it's got love in it you know it's almost like permission just to be and so when I put my awareness on whatever it is it's just permission for it to be you know and I think of the whole idea that I have to improve or fix myself is the obstacle I don't have to do that I just have to see what's here and in seeing what's here it, it'll change on its own because change is the nature I mean change is just another word for energy or nothing or the universe do you find yeah. that with your experience like do you, do you absolutely find that you... yeah I mean I, I'm a long time meditation practitioner and for me Meditation is really a, it's like a cat scan sort of where you mm -hmm. you just kind of sit going into si letting yourself be totally silent and when you in on the screen of that silence, uh, you naturally notice areas that need your loving attention you know mm -hmm. and the and the attention has a, a kind of a healing quality to it and you know over the course of an hour or whatever things just dissolve and get worked out and you know there's greater freedom greater depth that that in a way gets stabilized gets made permanent by having kind of resolved whatever little thing you were carrying around with you for God knows how long. <laughs> right. Only God does know. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah. That is, it's a very useful thing, being silent. As you know, I mean, you know, from your life experience, you know. Just, mm -hmm. I, if I'm not willing to meditate, and I don't necessarily mean look like the Buddha, just, you know, you could sit on a park bench or relax. Yeah, yeah. If I'm not willing to be alone and be quiet, I, it's, it's pretty hard. I, can, I can't imagine discovering anything that's worth anything because mm. the one thing that's always here no matter what's going on is that quiet it's like the million dollars I'm looking for is buried in my heart yeah and it's so and, amazing it's like it's the most it's hilarious how much seeking energy goes outwards for what's being looked for being right fucking here <laughs> right here yeah but if it's overlaid with layer after layer after layer uh, of, of agitation mm -hmm. you know then it can be obscured so you know sure, this this, sure. this being quiet that you're referring to kind of is an opportunity for the agitation to kind of settle down and to kind of like m allow that that thing which is right here to be more evident. Yeah. Yeah. And it does it does alter the physiology too. I mean, we live this through having a body. If we didn't have a body, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. Uh, or living anything, or holding signs in the street, or anything else. So yeah. it's it's almost like we're kind of fine tuning our instrument, um, our living instrument. By, by doing this. And the, the fun play, way to play with that in words even is I don't have a body because watch, who's to, the body's talking right here. I mean the whole right. thing, uh, the body is another word for the universe. I mean I don't, right. it's, not, it's not that there's a me that has a body, there's the body. Yeah. And that's very beautiful, like oh wow, there's another, like, another little apparent split that I don't have to keep entertaining. Mm -hmm. I am the body, fine. Yep. Leave it there and see what happens. You know, that's what that's it's so relaxing because I had that. I have, I this is, you know, there's sort of the mind body split, the Descartes split. It's like, wait, wait, hold on. What are we really, where is that? Mm -hmm. Where is that really if I don't play with the letters? That's yeah, good. I'm glad you added that. Yeah. It's hard to find. These separations we can do in language are very difficult to find in the immediate experience. Mm -hmm. Are you um, apolitical or do you find that your, um, your strong feelings about? kindness and love and caring and all that um, tend to align you with certain political perspectives or movements like Occupy Wall Street or any of those types of things? Yeah, well, I think it's useful, yes. There's a sort of pay-it-forward economy that feels, feels useful to begin to kind of talk about as opposed to the sort of, I have my stuff, you have to, you know, we, we love each other. So while trading is useful, sharing is also useful. So I notice there's some energy in there in the Occupy way. And then I'm a big fan of, of rights for all people who enjoy pleasure that are that is not necessarily heterosexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a, it feels very crazy to me that the Bible still has influences in public policy <laughs> because it's it's not it's not. I mean, that's a book written 2,000 years ago by people who didn't know about the genes, genomes, germs, refrigeration, electricity, airplanes, the internet sunglasses. The fact that that book continues to inform public policy feels so wrong and unfortunate for us in our world because there are people every day who are being denied rights because somebody somewhere believes there's an invisible being that wrote a book and that that has to be taken seriously. Mm. Those people, I mean, imagine 2,000 years ago, if they knew about airplanes and the internet and modern medicine is the bible what they would come up with now <laughs> i mean it's not it's just it's in crazy to me and so anything that denies gay rights transgender rights bisexual rights women's rights children's rights minority rights all of those things 
that has to be spoken out against because it's it's again it's working towards this equality. Yeah. Did you ever see that letter to Dr. Laura that circulated around on the internet? It's, it's really hilarious. It's things like, I would like to sell my daughter into slavery as sanctioned in Exodus 21.7. In this day and age, what do you think would be a fair price for her? <laughs> and well, then yeah. there, there's all kinds of things. I have a neighbor who insists on working on the Sabbath. Exodus 35.2 clearly states he should be put to death. Am I morally obligated to kill him myself? <laughs> the, meta all... the metaphor was useful when it yeah. was created as a form, <laughs> as a tool not only maybe of illumination, but more likely as control. It is not useful now. We cannot have a president in the United States who doesn't admit that there's an invisible being somewhere that's watching over people. That's crazy to me. Yeah. Like, why is that still something that is taken seriously? And I understand it in sort of the, the softer both and side, where it's like, you know, ideas are a momentum. They latch on. Beliefs are so powerful. How beliefs work in the physiology is almost everything. So I get why it's still happening. But we have to begin to talk out against it, not necessarily to start wars, but just to be like, look, we are all here together. And that's where the love and the kindness and the equality, even to people who believe the Bible. I'm not against them. I'm against their beliefs. I have to be, because otherwise I'm allowing something that continues to create more and more violence and uncomfortable suffering and, and discomfort for my friends, for, my, for, my, for the people I care about in this world who are not heterosexual and who are not necessarily white men. Yeah. Well, it's like we were saying before about beliefs versus uh, experience. You know, if you, if you hang your hat on a whole set of beliefs which are not necessarily um, connected with actual you know, nitty-gritty experience in the world, in this world that we live in, then y things can get very disjointed and, un and crazy and unfair. I agree. Yeah. And I think that's one of, one of the things about spirituality that's a little dangerous is it does kind of create a sort of anything goes mentality, at least it can in the non-duality circles, it's kind of like it, anything doesn't go. We, we shouldn't let injustices and violence just we, sh we seemingly we can speak out against that in the most loving, peaceful, throwing a net over it way we can. But it's so important to begin to, or to continue, whoever it is who's listening, like to continue or to begin to, wait, what, what do I really care about? Because I'm going to have to speak up against it. Because all there are are animals with ideas mm. <laughs> us using force or not on Earth. That's all that's happening is animals well, and ideas using force or not. That thing you just said about the, in the non-duality community, this, uh, I forget the way you phrased it, but you know, I, what I think it is is a confusion of levels fallacy where you know, there's a, uh, the, you know, because on some level things are experienced or understood to be all non-dual, it's sometimes extrapolated from that to, um, to assume that therefore we don't have to there's, you know, worry about this problem or concern ourselves with that situation at all because there really is no one to worry or concern. I mean, there's even one, some guy who's a well-known non-duality teacher said that, told me that some guy called him up and he said he wanted to have an affair, you know, and he wanted to sort of get a little bit of reassurance ahead of time that there really was no one doing anything and therefore that sort of excuse, that would excuse his behavior and assuage his constant conscience. <laughs> Yeah, that happens, and, and you know, that, that, that's a perfect expression of everything, trying to get information about whether or not it's okay to bone the neighbor, but, it's, <laughs> but it's, it's still, it's like in that moment, there's a, there's a, there's seemingly there's a responsibility towards honesty and kindness and mutual self-respect, mm -hmm. and I think that that's sort of, it's important. Again, this isn't, it's very easy to all of a sudden become like moralizing and fascist. I, I'm not speaking in a dictatorial way, but whatever I value, I have to, I have to speak up against. Yeah, I or I have it. to promote. I mean, I have to say, like, look, like, my friends who are gay are not evil. They have every right to exist. They have every right to equal rights. We have to speak out against that, and and just to make sure that the voices don't din in the the onslaught of ideas. And this is what see me. I mean, this is what's so beautiful about the world. That's what's happening all over the world. I mean, all over the world, they're just ideas competing for attention within brains, yeah. and then the brains live out the behavior of the idea. And so that's where the silence is useful, like, wait a minute, I want to get the opposite of an idea here for a second. And then can I use, can I use the energy of my life to promote love and kindness and what I value in a way that is really efficient? You know, because it, it does seem insane to me that certain ideas still run civil rights. I mean, it just, mm -hmm. it just doesn't make any sense. 
Here's another one from that Dr. Laura letter. A friend of mine feels that although eating shellfish is an abomination, Leviticus 11.10, <laughs> it is a lesser abomination than homosexuality. I don't, I don't agree. Can you settle this? <laughs> this? This whole letter was written to this woman who kind of like, you know, was a very conservative talk show host and, mm -hmm. and was railing against uh, homosexuality and so on. A lot of very funny points in it. Yeah. Um, but in any case. It's important. It's, I think it's important for each person who's listening you know, myself included, to, to feel into, like, what do I really care about here? If, if, for, if there were going to be, if there was a world 500 years from now, what would I really want to work hard so that people who experience, just like I do, sadness and joy and suffering and happiness and sharing, and what, what, what kind of world do I want to leave for them to encounter? Yeah. Because... We're all here. I mean, we're all here together, and and it's okay that you know I'm not. It's not. It's okay that people believe different things. And how how effective are those beliefs in creating communities that really flourish and work and allow for the variances that happen within the human species? Because that's that's this is the world we live in. You know, we don't. The Bible is not true, and so we have to begin to live in a world where we. Uh, acknowledge the reality of what's actually here not what we wish was here but what's really here and I would I say the Bible is not true it's I not true you... it's not true it's not an historical account of how the world actually works I will not bend on this point and I'm happy to stop but it's <laughs> not true the Bible is not a valid source of what's going on in the universe I would say this that it's a a snapshot. It's a perspective. It's a it's, poetry. It's yeah. It's it, a poorly it, written. I mean, Shakespeare. And, and like it, anything and else, it. like anything else, it's it's not. You know, there's you can't find a black and white uh, demarcation between truth and falsehood. There, it, it's like the yin yang symbol. You know, it, one side's white, the other side's black, and there's a there's a white dot in the black side and a black spot on the white spot on the white side. Everything has elements in it of value. Uh, even you know a pile of manure has tremendous value in its own right. Violence doesn't have value, Rick. No, but you know it's relative. It's relative. No, but this, this is where this philosophical conversation gets dangerous. It's okay. not relative. It's not relative. Violence does not have value. Not in our world. You know, I I agree with you and I disagree with you. I know I'm, I'm it's okay with that, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna back down because I, I cannot we cannot say in a philosophical way mm -hmm. that everything is relative, because that literally affects how we treat each other in this world. Okay, so we go on a safari in Africa and we see lions committing violence against zebras. We are not animals. I thought you said we were animals. We aren't, we're not animals? We are not animals in that way, Rick. We have a choice to love. We can choose to love. The modern conversation about no free will is going to turn us into zombies if we're not careful. We have a choice to love. And we, we wake up every day with that choice. I can either be afraid or I can love. A lion is following its conditioning. Yeah, and it's doing we, what's we, natural, totally natural totally. for a lion. And it's not yeah. that it hates the zebra. No, you know, of it just not. has to eat. <laughs> of course not. Yeah. And we and, and we're doing what's natural and what's included in what's natural is the reality that we can choose to love. Mm -hmm. And that's important. It's important to not let that get washed over by philosophy. Because that creates the world we live in. Like it has people passing people every day on the street who need help. Yeah. No, I, I really respect you for saying this, and, and I think you have a very integrated sort of mature, if we want to call it spirituality, you have a very much, much sort of mature expression of, of spirituality, because I think spirituality really has to in, in, embrace and encompass all the kinds of value things you're talking about here, if it's really complete, you know, it can't just be this sort of non-dual, impersonal, flat, detached, you know, thing, or it's not really the whole enchilada. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I'm just so kind of like ingrained with the notion that there's always a bit of the yin and the yang and vice versa, even so you, that I can't, I can't sort of categorically state that under no circumstances, under no conditions ever, ever is violence completely wrong because there might be a situation, you know, your sister getting attacked by a rapist or whatever, there might be a situation in which 
it's it's appropriate. So, well, you know, as much as we abhor it on a philosophical or heart level or whatever, there might be circumstances in which it's called for. I, I think there's always a possibility of a net. I agree yeah. that we might have to use force at times, but there's always the, the, the net, the isolation of the threat as opposed to the destruction of it is always possible when it comes to human beings. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like that guy in Sweden or Denmark or wherever you were, you know, that could have resulted in an altercation if you had bought into his energy, uh, you know, the guy that was swearing at you and stuff. Sure. Um, but instead you overcame that energy with love and diffused him. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, if, if we I, have if the... I, Go ahead. I just, you know, I just, there's a Lady Gaga quote that I love. She says, you know, I have to be willing to get kicked in the teeth for love. Mm. And, I, and I think that's it. It's not about proving anything. Like, look, I'm so willing to get kicked. It's not about that. It's like, if I'm going to quietly live what I value, which is the kindness and compassion that comes from equality and the connection, the amazing connection that yeah. this is, then I have to be willing to put my body on the line. Mm -hmm. Do you ever see the movie Gandhi? Mm -hmm, of course. When yeah, they're... remember that scene where they're the yeah, yeah, the yeah, poles, yeah. 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 They're just coming wave after wave and getting beaten, and, yeah. and, and that really, yeah. Well, you, you know, it, it helps to prove your point. I mean, Gandhi managed to pull it off against the British in India, whether it can always apply in every circumstance. Sure, you know? sure, sure. No, I agree. Yeah. There's, there's variances and contexts that are wide, but that doesn't mean that I, I can only aim for what I value. Yeah. So my firmness, you know, I think there's something useful to kind of like, we have, we have these ideas that, you know, anger is, is negative. Yeah. It's like there's healthy anger. There's anger that says, I'm going to get a net and throw it over the rapist mm -hmm. because I care about the, him and the people he's trying to affect. Yeah. It's like if I'm just kind all the time in that soft kind of farmer's market way, then I might miss out on the ability to set a nice firm boundary for the sake of everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I love that I meet these young kids sometimes who are like, oh, the cops suck. It's like, are you, you really want to live in a world without police? Yeah, right. The very idea that there's a force out there that is utilized in a way to restrain and to protect is, is really helpful socially because certain ideas come along that lead people to commit acts of violence. And so it's just sort of like it's important to value what we value and to not back down when it comes to love and to not back down when it comes to equality and to not back down when it comes to caring about each other because we're literally creating the world. And I can argue away that, you know, well, eventually the sun will expand and the earth will be inside of it. So, you know, who needs to care about my notes? But all of that is that way that I think that philosophy disconnects us from the reality of our living experience mm -hmm. and from the reality that there's more people coming than just me and that they too have the right to live in a world that is kind and compassionate and caring and open to intelligent creative exploration. I mean, if, imagine 2,000 years ago if, if people had just given up on that shit. You know, like, oh, fuck it, it doesn't matter. Imagine non-duality landing, like, in, you know, like, 500 AD. Oh, you know what, there's nothing here, who cares? You know, and, like, boom, and then nobody, nobody works, nobody tries, nobody efforts to create and continue to explore and solve the problems of disease and hunger and food and transportation. And it's like we're so intelligent as an organism, and then we can philosophize away our responsibility to all of us. And I, I mean, I've, I'm totally guilty of it. And so this whole experience of, of my heart, ex, ex, I myself experiencing my heart is just showing me how full of shit I've been in certain ways. <laughs> and I have to like, I have to call myself on it. Mm. You know, I'm not calling anyone else on it. I'm calling myself on it. My firmness is so that I remember not to get caught in philosophizing away the responsibility I have to my neighbors. I totally agree. And I'm, I'm really glad you're stating it so emphatically. Um, and I think there is too much of it in in certain you know spiritual circles, sometimes non-dual circles. It's it's like it's, it's like I was trying, uh, saying an hour ago that that you know level one doesn't negate level two or level three. That all the levels have their pertinence and their significance. And if you glom onto one to the exclusion of the others, you've got a lopsided spirituality. Um, you know you can be passionately concerned about the world and doing everything in your power to help it while at the same time recognizing that everything is perfect just as it is while at the same time recognizing that there is no world you know I agree with on, you on completely. some level I know I agree with you completely because energy energy and creativity and inspiration comes from all three of those together mm -hmm. 
Yep. But what happened, what's so easy to do is to forget the one where we're responsible for each other. Yeah. And I think that that's the only, I mean, that's sort of the emphasis right now. I learned the other two. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing going on, for sure. <laughs> and it's all one thing. Great. Okay, now how do I care? Yeah. That, that feels so, that's the new lesson for Benjamin, is how do I care? And, and it's, it's an ongoing, endless learning process. Yeah. And from what I can tell from this angle, you seem to be doing a good job of it. I mean, you're, you know, you're out on the street. You're, you know, you're thinking globally but acting locally. Um, you know, touching the lives of of a great many people, and through the internet, touching them even even a broader you know, circumference. Yeah, we'll see. You know, we'll see. Yeah. I can only do my best, and and like I just says, you know, I love that. You know, I'm gonna fail at it. Yeah. And that's the, from living from that place, making an effort, knowing that it's it doesn't save anyone. You know, there's this um, saying about this old man and a boy who were walking on a beach, and the tide was receding, and the beach was covered with starfish that had gotten stranded on the sand. You may have heard this story. Mm -hmm. And as they walk, they walk along, and every now and then the, the old man reaches down, picks up a starfish, and throws it in the ocean, and then they keep walking. He reaches down, picks up another one, throws it in the ocean, and the, the boy says, what difference can you possibly make? There are millions of them, you know? And he, at that, the old man reaches down, picks up another one, and throws in, in the ocean, and said, oh, I made a difference to that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. It's those kids holding hands trying to get that candy bar. Mm. You know, it's, it's that. And, then, and it's, 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 you know, there, there can be a hopelessness in trying. You know, I really want to, it's like, because it, obviously, I can't save anybody. So that's the first thing. I can't save anyone. Because if I try to save people, then there's that, there's that overwhelming hopelessness of like, holy shit, you know, there's too many of them. Mm -hmm. So it's first the maturity of like, okay, I can't save anyone. Now, how can I offer some help today? Knowing full well that they're going to die. It's that perfect marriage between nothing and everything. How do I act knowing that ultimately the act doesn't mean anything? But in this moment right here, right now, it means everything because that balance it just leads to kindness I mean it leads to a world we, we love to live in yeah, that's great it just reduces the stresses that come from our beliefs and our ideas about trying to control each other and, and be safe be safe you know we're so safe if we work together <laughs> we're not safe from disease and we're not safe from natural disasters but we're definitely safe from each other if we work together mm. Yeah. I appreciate you taking, you know, I, I know I'm being emphatic and I, I just appreciate your, your attention and your listening. I, I don't mean any aggression, aggressive disrespect. I just get very passionate about this point. Cause it's I can so, handle it's so, you, dude. It's so easy to overlook. Oh, I know you can, but I, I know that, you know, there's a way that it's important. You know, I'm not enlightened. I'm not awakened. You know, I just, I just am doing my best to try to be a good person. And, and that's, that's all that really matters. Well, you know, basically, I, I agree with everything you're saying, and it's just that whenever there's a little point of apparent disagreement, if we chew on it for a while, and we've done this several times during this interview, it kind of, uh, you know, dissolves, and we, and we swallow it. So, um, Yeah, no, I enjoy it. I just notice, I think I notice that there's a way that I get emphatic that's slightly uncomfortable for me, so that's what I'm addressing. Yeah, well, we don't want to be wild-eyed fanatics, but uh, I think we don't want to be colorless saps either. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, no, I, I agree. I, think I a, agree. A good, a good deal of zeal and enthusiasm, I think, is a healthy thing. I mean, you, it's what kind of gets you up off your butt and out out there doing something. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know. Yeah, for um, sure. So, mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, and I mean, I get quite you know, incensed about certain, some of the same points we've been discussing and, and related ones, you know, like I get these emails from people that say, oh, there's no climate change or whatever, you know, because the oil companies are putting out a lot of propaganda money, you know, try to convince people that there's no climate change because they want to make a few bucks, you know, a few ticks on the dial regardless of what happens to their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I get all steamed up about that sort of thing. Sure. Great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, there's, there really are injustices that just kind of come from a selfishness that doesn't include the other selves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's a selfishness that includes uh, the self, and then there's a selfishness. And so I think that there's, it's wonderful to speak out against those injustices. 
You know, I don't, right. want to, I don't want to go to war over them, but I want to be able to at least make sure my voice doesn't dim. Well, going to war over them would be self-defeating. Definitely. Uh, and, you know, and, you know, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I, I do think that that whole mentality that we're kind of speaking about here is on its way out. I really mm -hmm. hope so. Uh, yeah. But there are signs, you know, um, and the, even this sort of global uh, upsurge of awakening people and, you know, kind of the egalitarian nature of it all over the world is, um, I think, symptomatic perhaps of a darker time, you know, having its day and the, the, the sun is rising. Yeah. The egalitarian quality happens irregardless of, of the conversation of awakening, and I think that's the benefit you know, in some ways of making sure that the hierarchy and spirituality isn't taken too seriously because there's people every day all over the world that are not involved in, in this particular kind of conversation that are definitely promoting this exact same value. Absolutely. Because no, I mean, my point being that nobody has to awaken to share love and kindness and equality. It's already right here available to all of us to share at any moment whether or yeah. not we tend to have had a particular experience or not. Oh, yeah. I mean, after Mother Teresa died, they found her diaries and all, and she was lamenting the fact that she felt like she didn't have any kind of inner experience, you know. She felt like she was a total failure, you know, but here she was one of the most compassionate people we've, we've seen in our, in our generation. Yeah, not if you ask Christopher Hitchens, but for the most part. Uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm always fascinated by someone who speaks out so strongly against something that seemingly is so is very beautiful so I remember reading some of his notes about that and I was like you know it's, it's useful in that way that Sam Harris speaks out against religion or you know it's yeah. very useful to have people who are willing to shout something that whoa they said that and and kind of add that to the conversation just to even just sort of stoke the fires of, of actually thinking mm -hmm. you know there's something very useful to actually thinking you know, and that's the other thing in the spiritual conversation. It's kind of like, you know, you kind of get into that, well, let's, you know, you're going for no thought or you're going for the silence. It's like, hold on, you have an incredible capacity to reason. You know, it's very useful to use that because mm -hmm. so much of the beauty of our world is, is created through that process yeah. of sitting together and hashing over ideas and thinking, just like we're doing now. Yeah. Like, Again, it's like the, we come back to the point of it's, the whole package, you know, if you just kind of you know, lock into one component of it and make that the all, then yeah. you've got a lopsided situation, but it, it's always more, in the, the whole, whole package. Mm -hmm. And traditionally that was understood, I think, by many of the great teachers and sages, you know, they didn't just sort of um, z narrow it down to, you know, some particular flavor of experience or non-duality or whatever, they generally, you know, offered a, a more complete teaching. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking about dead people, but I mean, there's... Well, no, but I mean, yeah. I get what you're saying. You know, there's, yeah. there's a value to make sure we include everything. Yeah, yeah. All the aspects of our life, cleaning the toilet, and voting for the president, and caring mm -hmm. for the kids, and mm -hmm. all of those yeah. things have to be included in my... Yep. Well, I think we've beat that point to death. Totally. Um, yeah. What else? In a nonviolent way, of course. Sure. Oh, yes. <laughs> we, we feather fluffed it to death. We yeah, that's right. It. Tickled it to death. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I appreciate so, talking to you. It's really yeah, nice. this is great. Thank all you right. so much. Yeah. 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 Um, it's funny, you know, because when I listened to all your videos and stuff, I was thinking, well, you know, am, am I going to be in danger of getting too intellectual with Ben? I mean, he just seems to be such a down-to-earth kind of guy, and, uh, and I tend to get off in my thoughts and theories and, and so on and so forth. But I think we've really found a nice balance here. And, um, and you know, you're anybody's match on the intellectual level as well as, you know, the heart level and everything else. I, I really appreciate your kind of integrated <clears throat> development and perspective. Yeah, I'm still learning it. Oh, yeah, aren't we all? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're works in progress. It's fun to play. You know, in the, in the video, I think of the video sometimes, like you said, you know, performance art. Like, there's a seriousness within the conversation that I like to try to soften, but then there's also moments where it's useful to be serious. So yeah. the, vid the videos have been a very fun way to play with, you know, just wait. Think about it like taking different angles on different ideas. And, and I, appreciate, you know, I, I appreciate being able to share it. It's a very funny thing. 
Yeah. One thing I meant to ask you, I didn't actually watch the videos. I do this thing where I, I have this software that download. I can go to a YouTube page and download in one stroke all the videos, convert them to audio, and then up and then bring them into my into iTunes. You know, within a few minutes, and then put them on my iPod, and then I'm listening while I'm riding my bike or cutting the grass. Oh, cool. Stuff like that. And uh, so a lot of times I heard you doing this thing, which to me sounded like kind of like kundalini explosions or something uh, it's it's like you were kind of like <laughs> mm -hmm. going, is that what it was i mean we were kind of getting mm -hmm. having a kundalini episode or something yeah oh okay i'm just yeah. curious because i couldn't tell from the audio yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> well there's there's a little beatboxing in there but then there's the there's the kundalini in yeah the beatboxing was good too i thought that was pretty you could actually you know get up on a stage someplace and do some of that it'd be fun yeah i don't know we'll yeah. see it hasn't happened yet but i don't know if, yeah. i don't know okay I might be shy when it comes to actual reality. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Videos, you know, it's it's so safe. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, I can't say that. I don't know yeah. until I stand up there. Yeah, you don't strike me as being a terribly shy person. Mm. I think I am sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, eat powder milk biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> What's that from? I feel like uh, I see. I just saw a sign, but I don't know what it is. Garrison Keillor, he, he, oh, uh, he uh, Prairie Home Companion, he does these ads for like the Ketchup Advisory Council and Powder Milk Biscuits. They give shy people the, the courage to get up and do what uh, needs to be done. Awesome. <laughs> I'll have some in a bag before yeah, I... Right. <laughs> 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 all righty well let's wrap it up so right. this has been great fun ben thank um, you so much for your time i really appreciate it yeah now before you hang up on me i just want to make some concluding remarks um for those listening okay I i've been speaking with benjamin Smythe. um do you have a website i do it's uh, www.benjamintsmythe.com mm -hmm. Okay, good. And I'll be linking to that from batgap.com, as I always do with my guests. Um, you haven't written any books, I don't suppose. Uh, no. Okay, no problem. Uh, but anyway, I'll link to your website and um, maybe also to your YouTube page, or you probably link to that from your website. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people can watch some of these videos that I've been talking about. Uh, for those who might be new to this program, um, I do one every week. I think this might be number 117 or something. Uh, and uh, I, I got you know new ones coming up every week. So if you have enjoyed this, you might like to tune into some of the others. You can do that either in video, and you can remind your have you can have yourself be reminded by subscribing to the YouTube channel or going to BatGap.com and signing up for an email reminder. Uh, there's also a podcast there uh, that you can sign up for so that you can listen just to the audio on your iPod or whatever. And there's a discussion group that pops up around every interview, and which sometimes gets very lively. There's also a Yahoo chat group that you'll find a link to from there. Um, so there's all kinds of possibilities. So check it out. And thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And we will see you next week. Cool. Have a good day. Thanks, Ben. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you.